Uh, good evening uh, from Miami. This is John Quelch, the uh, Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, I'm delighted to have uh, so many of our students, faculty, staff members, alumni, and friends uh, from around the world on this uh, call, uh, part of the Night Venture Leaders series. Uh, another fireside chat, our last fireside chat of the year, uh, this time with uh, Chip Fawcett. Corsic, who is the uh, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, 2U and uh, a native son of Plantation, Florida. Right, Chip? That's right, John. Okay. Thrilled to be here with you today, by the way. Thrilled to be Thank here. Thank you so much. Where, where are you today? Where are you speaking to us from? I'm at my home in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, just like uh -huh. everyone else working, uh, working from home these days. So in my home office. Um, but uh, yes, my original home, I was born in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida right down there by the U. Righto, terrific. And you're a big Miami Dolphins fan, I understand. Is that correct? Yes, I am a very big Miami Dolphins fan. Uh, sadly for me over the last 20 years, but I would say more recently, uh, it's been pretty exciting. Great year this year in particular so far. So yeah. go Tua. Good, indeed. Um, listen, uh, let's start off with a, a simple question. What is 2U and uh, what's the history of this company? So I started the company uh, with a small team of people uh, almost 13 years ago now. Uh, and we're a digital transformation partner for the great university like the University of Miami. Uh, we partner with great schools to build what we believe is the world's best online education across a whole variety of different products. So uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees, technical boot camps, and short courses where you might uh, learn a particular skill or a functional leadership course or diversity course uh, to, to stand out from the crowd and get ahead. Um, so relevant online training, you know, we believe that higher education needs to meet the needs of the critical needs of society. And uh, we think the online environment is a, is a big part of that. So it's been a great run, uh, started the company uh, a long time ago now, and we've been a publicly traded company for about seven years. So we're on the NASDAQ. Uh, we're based headquarters right here in, right near me in Washington, DC. Uh, but we have uh, around 3,800 employees all over the world. So our second largest office is in Cape Town, South Africa, interestingly, hmm. where we have um, about 900 people. So it is a global company. This is a global story. The digital transformation of the great university is definitely a global story. And as you could imagine, John, during this time of COVID, uh, what a crazy year. This has been for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get to that uh, a little bit later, but I'm curious, why, why the passion for education? Uh, there are not so many entrepreneurs who uh, uh, get into education as their life's work. Uh, why, yeah, why and, and you know, I, on top of that, ed tech's a tough run. You know, as the dean of a great B school, you know, you, you're studying all of the various sectors. If you think about education as a, as a sector, uh, it's right up there with retail in terms of the percent of GDP that's consumed. You know, you're talking about a very large market. And then if you look at the large companies, you know, in all these other sectors, whether it be transportation or retail or energy, you've got these very large companies. And in education, that's not the case. We're one of the very few publicly traded companies. So I would say it's actually uh, ed tech can be a pretty tough road from the standpoint of uh, and investors and um, I got into this, uh, I would say it all starts with when I grew up in South Florida, uh, couldn't be uh, more proud to be uh, the son of Ed and Ellie Palsek, they're incredible people, um, but didn't grow up with a huge amount of resources and um, was fortunate enough to, to get a full tuition scholarship to attend university and uh, got a Pell Grant to attend and uh, went up to Washington DC to George Washington University to attend school. And I would say it just completely changed my life in every possible way. So education is very core to me right here. Um, you know, I'd never seen snow. I'd been out of Florida only a couple of times in my life. Um, and it just completely transformed me. Uh, you know, all of a sudden this kid from South Florida was four blocks away from the White House, meeting incredible people, being taught by great faculty. And, you know, I really believe in the power of the great university to transform somebody's life. And that's what happens every day at a school like University of Miami, or in my case, GW, or candidly, any of the partners we work with. So that led me down a path of, uh, you know, of really getting uh, interested in, in the power of higher ed. But, 
you know, if you go back through my story, I started in politics and then eventually started a company that I ran for a long time and then came back a little bit more into politics. And then eventually that led to me starting to you. And I'm happy to take you through any of that you'd want to hear about. But, you know, when you work with partners like uh, University of Miami to help people transform themselves, uh, you know, for me, that's a big part of why I'm still doing this. You know, we've been been doing this for a long time now. And most people, I would say with some reflection, most people that you know, start a company and are fortunate enough to get to the public markets end up, uh, you know, leaving at, at that time. And I'm, you know, seven years later, I'm, I'm still, still ticking here, still cooking on this. Why? Because I just believe our story is nowhere near done for me. You know, I'm very excited about what's ahead for the company. What, what, what are the uh, two or three comments that you would make to a prospective investor and to you who would say, well, what's your business model? How do you make money? So we partner with a great school uh, to help them build high quality products across what we call the career curriculum continuum. So we do think the university is central to the student's life. And we think the modern university needs to think about lifelong learning as a core part of their value proposition. So uh, not just the traditional way we might have thought of a student sort of graduating from high school and then going to college and then off on their own for the rest of their lives. Like the notion of continuing to educate people throughout their life, we believe the university can be a huge part of that. And in doing so, we invest and help uh, schools build high quality programs, whether they be the boot camps that we have at University of Miami for technical training or short courses that we have at schools like the London School of Economics or MIT or degrees like you might see at some of our programs at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill or Northwestern. And we share tuition revenue over the life of a contract. So 2U stands behind the university uh, so our programs are powered by 2U, but the university is fully in charge of the program. It's their admissions characteristics. It's their faculty. It's their instruction. And we effectively power the entire thing. So we provide the investment to get it all up and running. Uh, we market the programs on a worldwide basis. Uh, we support the students on a 24-hour basis worldwide. We do things like clinical placement, John, which you know is, is maybe not uh, as exciting to talk about as the technology, but critical for students that are in programs like a physician assistant program. We have the only online physician assistant program, and that's with Yale University. So we stand behind the university and power the experience. And for that, we uh, take a revenue share. Uh, uh, varies depending on the product and the amount of investment that 2U puts into the program. And over time, uh, that creates a really compelling, sustainable model. We call it a shared success model. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if you saw yesterday, we had a really big announcement for the company. Uh, we announced uh, really the largest deal that we've ever done with Chapel Hill, with Carolina. And, uh, you know, it's to power everything across the institution. So that deal is, you know, it candidly, it's, it's really the size of what 2U was when we IPO, just that one deal. And you don't get there without having proven the model on both sides. You know, student outcomes, number one. And then a great business for us and for the university. You have to have both. You know, if the student wins, the university wins, and then two you wins. That's the way we think about it. Okay. Let, let me uh, ask you, if I could, to compare uh, to you um, and the other full service companies in that space with a couple of other entities that I think some of our audience members will be familiar with and just try and if you can help us delineate the differences as you see uh, see them between these uh, various buckets of uh, of uh, competitors, so there's there's a group of competitors that would be uh, typified by let's say edX, uh, which is the Harvard MIT collaboration and Coursera. Uh, what do they do differently in their business models vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, yourselves? So when you say full service competitors, you know, we feel like uh, at this point, we provide a comprehensive solution for the university partner. It's a combination of technology, people and data to power the experience. So uh, the data architecture is threaded through the entire experience. And we have uh, really high quality technology throughout, not just the student delivery, but to deliver for the university partner. And I would say in the case of 2U compared to an edX or a Coursera, we are certainly a bit more behind the scenes. So it is powered by 2U. Uh, 
uh, and we work with a university partner. We really call them partners for a reason. So this is, um, you know, this is not, uh, we're not really a vendor to the schools. This is a co-investment of not just capital, but know-how over a really long time period. Now, when we think of the partnerships, you know, we're, we're a bit more of the subservient partner, the university's out in front. And if you compare us to uh, Coursera as an example, uh, Coursera started off as a massive open online course provider. So the MOOC, which um, people might be familiar with, where people can go and learn something for free. Um, and they did that uh, with great fanfare uh, on, on a worldwide basis. And, you know, it was interesting. We lived through the MOOC hype, hype cycle because we started the company way back in 2008. And the MOOCs didn't show up until about four years later and then obviously caught fire. And I would say over time, you know, interestingly, Coursera has uh, gradually uh, really pivoted some of its strategy to be more like 2U. So now Coursera partners with schools to provide some of the things 2U provides uh, and indeed shares revenue just like we do. Uh, so it used to be uh, very different. And I would say over time, uh, it is appropriate to think about us as a more core competitive set. Um, edX is a nonprofit uh, partnered with, uh, that was founded by uh, Harvard and MIT, uh, similar to Coursera. Uh, that nonprofit distinction um, at, at times uh, makes them uh, exciting to certain university partners over Coursera and so on and so forth. You know, but at this stage, we've got uh, over 75 great universities. Uh, we share many clients with both Coursera and edX. You know, it's interesting when we started the company, this whole thing became called online program management, which I know you've heard of, John, people call it OPM. That's what our space is called. And as the only public company, you know, we tend to take the hits for the space. You know, we're out there every day when you're public, you know, it's all out there. Like, you know, you can't hide. And um, it, the online program management, it's such a quaint term at this point, because like, we don't even really know what it means anymore. If you ask people to kind of define what online program management means, you know, they think of a company like 2U and they can't really name many of the other companies. You know, they might know Pearson, uh, but really truly, if you think about what, it, what that market is today, you know, edX and Coursera and companies that are more recent startups um, like Guild and other companies are all function in this space of working with the university to help them do online things. And uh, so, you know, we think more and more of ourselves as a digital transformation agent for the school because this long-term product strategy is really critical to helping the university meet the needs of the learner. And if you think at the end of the day, like why you go to work every day is to really help somebody transform their career by attending a great program through your fantastic university. And uh, to do that in the online environment across all these different subjects, you know, pu public private partnerships are an excellent way to sort of see force multiplication from that, to have a greater impact than you might be able to do uh, just on your own. You know, in some ways, we're a conduit of capital uh, from the public, from the private markets to a great university uh, to allow, uh, you know, the, the proper amount of investment required to really build something at scale in a way that is difficult for schools to fully do on their own. Okay, so let, let me give you a, another example of a school that has attempted to do it on its own, which would be uh, Purdue acquiring Kaplan and yeah. uh, coming up with Purdue Global. Um, how, how would you uh, how would you assess that? Well, if you think about um, what, what's happened more recently in our space, when we IPO'd the company, there were very few large uh, online program management businesses, and, but there were a lot of for-profit universities and those became quite controversial. Uh, and uh, controversial primarily because the student outcomes were not always fantastic. And so you had uh, a huge percentage of, of student debt and you had people not completing the programs and you know, that's not a great mix. Uh, so now to be fair, there, there are some solid for-profit universities, just like any other market, there are some that are good and some that are not as good. Um, what you've seen more recently is some of the for-profit universities converting themselves into a 2U-like business uh, and sharing tuition with the, the, the university partner that, that is acquiring 
the former university. So that's exactly what happened in the case of Purdue is they acquired Kaplan and Kaplan then became a service provider, somewhat like to you uh, and shares tuition revenue over a really, really long contract. Uh, you know, I think we try to distinguish ourselves as much as possible just on the quality of these programs, John. Like, I mean, you know, you don't get a top 20 institution like University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to do what they did yesterday with a full institutional suite across the whole school, if it's not really good, it's gotta be really good. And you know, whether you look at our degree programs where retention uh, is in the low 80s, or you look at our short courses where completion rate is above 90%, you look at the job outcomes for the boot camps, like we've seen at University of Miami with over 200 graduates coming out of your school in particular, getting great jobs at many uh, important companies, some not in the Florida area and then some outside the Florida area, um, just incredible results. And so, uh, you know, over time, for-profit education really did get a bit of a bum rap. You know, preconceived notions of online ed are bad. And that tends to be a big problem for a company like 2U. And a lot of that is because for a long time, the for-profits uh, produced a lot of revenue, but not necessarily a lot of student outcomes. Uh, and if you throw in a, a pretty large debt burden, you know, if you think about 2U, we're pretty proud that um, the student outcomes are incredibly high and our schools are very satisfied. Uh, but if you look across the business, less than 40% of our revenue is actually Title IV funded. So I think we've got, uh, you know, we've got a blueprint for really high quality online education that we think uh, is a bit underappreciated by the market, to be candid. Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at all of the um, aspects of the service that you provide uh, across the value add chain from, you know, starting up yep. to actually measuring the student outcomes, which, which are the two or three elements that you think the independent uh, university finds it hardest to do for itself? In other words, wh where is the, the real added value of the uh, the outside resource in uh, in helping a university to tackle the online market so you know it's interesting so we call it two uos a uh, combination of technology people and data to build deliver and support all of this uh, activity and uh you know i mentioned already the investment john that's a non-trivial component mm -hmm. um so you know these it's not inexpensive to do this and um you know, we provide the capital to, to, to get the program going, to continue to service the program long term. Uh, the marketing is complicated. You know, digital marketing today is, uh, is extraordinarily challenging. And, you know, candidly, I think the digital marketing is an example of something the university really can't do the way we can do. Uh, very difficult for the school to do it on their own. Number one, the scale. So we're talking about you know, share a voice across um, online master's degrees, as an example, is very high for 2U programs. That gives us uh, the ability to deploy the marketing spend in a really efficient manner. Um, you know, the, the marketing engine today is, uh, you know, I have an incredibly talented left brain, uh, very data-driven marketing team that, you know, it's machine learning across hundreds of thousands of campaigns uh, to optimize the marketing spend in a way that will find the right student, not just any student. And honestly, I think it's very difficult to replicate. It's hard enough for us to hire these folks. And the network that comes with it, it's just impossible to do some of these things as an individual institution that you can do when working with, uh, you know, we go across 75 different schools. You know, and coming back to your comparison with the MOOC players, John, that's really part of the deal with Coursera and edX is they're aggregating people into a platform uh, and offering products from many different institutions across that platform. We do something very similar, different methodology, but very similar. So ultimately, it's difficult for the schools to do that. Now, I would also say, you know, we're really good at scale. Uh, clinical placements, I mentioned that earlier. You know, we just passed 50, 58,000 agencies under contract. What does that mean? Like, we're putting nurses into doctor's offices. We're putting potential social workers into clinics. We're putting physician assistants and sp speech pathologists. These are all people that are in high demand uh, master's programs with great job outcomes 
who need to go in and do something in the doctor's office or in the clinic. You know, one of our programs with Georgetown is a master of science in midwifery. And the people that are watching this that have heard me talk before have probably heard this line, but you don't want to go to a midwife that delivered a virtual baby. Like you got to go in and deliver the baby, you know? So we find a location for you to go do that uh, under Georgetown's supervision. And ultimately, that's really difficult for a university to do, even in its local area, much less across, you know, think about somebody enrolling from University of Miami and wanting to do their clinical placement in Oklahoma. You know, that's not easy. So, uh, and then finally, I would say the data architecture. I think the learning experience, the student support experience, all of it is like, the technology is important, but today there are many great technology platforms one could utilize. And Zoom as an example is a big, big, uh, we're, you know, we're a big advocate of Zoom. Zoom is a, is a partner for 2U. Um, but I would say that the architecture underneath all of this to allow us to really uh, drive the right long-term outcome for both the university and the student is all about the data. And I think that that's actually quite difficult uh, for the university to manage uh, more broadly. So I would also tell you, uh, one of the common misnomers that I hear uh, pretty frequently uh, is people tend to say, oh, the university should do this on its own or do it with two you. And our best relationships are truly working with the people at the university who you might argue theoretically should do it instead of me. Like our best relationships are when we're partnered with the school. And so this notion of an internal OPM, I think is a bit of a fallacy. Like our, the schools that we do this best with, it's very hand in glove. You know, an example of that is one of our undergraduate programs is, um, we have a really high quality online undergrad uh, program. Uh, it's, I think, seven total degrees with the London School of Economics. And, you know, it's an incredible program that by, you know, we get into next year, it'll be one of two U's largest programs. It's already getting big. And it's just a very tight relationship between these incredibly competent people on their side and the expertise on our side and our investment backs it. So, you know, the investment is, is something that uh, people tend to focus on the rev share because it gets a lot of attention. Oh, two U is taking this or taking that. First of all, we never think of it as taking. These are truly partnerships and where they work best, you know, the university does really well. So one of the things we've made clear is the university has to be fully sustainable. And as you know, that's been a real struggle for US higher ed in particular. So we think we've got a really good strategy of sustainability for the institution. Now I'll take okay. a pause there. You got me going on that one, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think you've kind of alluded to this already, but uh, uh, when when a partnership doesn't work out, and I presume sometimes it doesn't, um, what, what, what are the two or three reasons? What are the two or three watch outs that uh, you would uh, uh, say to any institution that's considering uh, this sort of a relationship? So I'll tell you, the most important is alignment. Uh, you know, great, con I, I was taught long ago by one of my first bosses that uh, great contracts are about alignment of interest more than anything else. You can only legislate so much. You know, you're trying to align interest and you can get there with some legal language. But if you're looking at the contract all the time, you're dead. Uh, so, well, why is that so important in this business? You know, investors often say, why don't you just go around the university? Don't even deal with the university. And, you know, number one, we're a huge believer in the power of the great university. Like, people don't appreciate how powerful the university brands are. And, and they think of brand, the word brand and they immediately think marketing. And the word brand is much more about relationships than anything else. And like the relationship you form with the people that attend the U is permanent. It's permanent. It's so powerful. You know, people return to stand in front of the U and get married. You know, like it's a permanent relationship. You don't find that with a consumer product very often. So um, I guess I would say uh, one of the reasons, that, so we believe that working with a great university, you can unlock a huge market opportunity for a company like 2U. But the tricky part is the great university, by definition, faculty governance is wildly complicated. And I don't have to tell you this, that is a complicated part of working with a nonprofit university. And so uh, getting alignment you know, you can't do a two U deal unless you have the administration 
and you have the dean and you have the faculty. You have to have sort of all three. You have to have the school level, the university level, and most importantly, the faculty. So when deals don't go well, it is because there really wasn't proper alignment coming in. And, you know, it's hard because sometimes, you know, there might be a great market opportunity. So, you know, we've had examples of, you know, programs that we could make much bigger than the school wants to make it. And the reality is we might have already invested to make it large and the school just doesn't want to make it large. That can be a challenge at times. Uh, so we try to create the best alignment possible. By the way, in that case, John, the school wins because the school's really in charge of these programs. One of the more frustrating aspects of the sort of narrative around our space is people kind of thinking that we're actually in charge. Like, no, the schools really are in charge of these programs. So when you see things not go as well as you would want, it really is typically because there might be more of an alignment problem. So we've learned a lot over the years in terms of getting, uh, creating that buy-in up front so that uh, you can make sure that once you're in the weeds, uh, that everybody's uh, doing, you know, sort of rowing in the same direction, you know, in the boat. Uh, and it's hard to do, but when it works, God, it's beautiful because the, you know, faculty governance also brings so many positives with it. When you really corral that faculty, you know, I had a, a provost a long time ago say to me, this isn't about fear of change. It's about fear of loss. It's fear of identity loss. You know, the, the, the school has done something so well for so long and done it a particular way that people are trying to sort of remove their, you know, it's, it's so core to them. And once you show faculty a path that allows them to do this really positively in the online environment, we found it to be a game changer. Okay. What uh, distinction do you see between undergraduate versus graduate uh, degree programs when it comes to uh, online? And a sort of similar question, uh, you've mentioned a number of professional fields, uh, including nursing, um, et cetera, as well as business. Uh, where, where does online business education uh, for a university fit in terms of the magnitude of the opportunity, the growth rate of the opportunity, et cetera? I mean, it's huge. Uh, so to address your first question, you know, we, uh, you know, an example of a COVID impact is we are having we believe this is because of COVID. We're having more conversations at the online undergrad level than we've ever had before. And the reason I say it's because of COVID is on some level, you know, the boogeyman of higher ed, of, of online ed has been removed. You know, whether people liked it or not, everyone was forced to go online immediately. And uh, it did remove uh, from the faculty, many faculty never wanted to go online and then all of a sudden had to go online. And whether they liked it or not, uh, many faculty were all of a sudden, oh, okay, maybe this isn't so bad. And that has led to, uh, you know, a surprising number of president and provost conversations with 2U about what new online degrees might look like for the undergrads. And we've got two up and running. We have one at Simmons College in Boston, Historic Women's College. And we have uh, one with, um, in each case, multiple degrees at Simmons and uh, at London School of Economics and the University of London in the UK. And they're off to a great start. You know, as I mentioned, the LSC program will be one of our largest next year. So um, doing really well. Uh, so you know, the first distinction would be in the grad market, you, know, you are dealing with working adults. And in the traditional undergrad market, you're dealing with the 18 to 24 year olds. And when you go online, people think of undergrad and they think of that 18 to 24 year old showing up uh, in Coral Gables, you know, ready to, to go uh, tackle the U. And most people that are in online undergrad programs are in their thirties or forties with kids. So it is, it is a working adult typically. Now, one of the surprising things about the London School of Economics program, John, is uh, we're right now pretty surprised that a third of the students are actually between 20 and 26. So that really surprised us, a much higher percentage than we expected. Uh, so you need to extend uh, support and mentoring a bit more actively uh, than you might in the grad programs. Uh, I think we were pretty well situated to tackle undergrad because we had done grad education so differently than most people had. And the white glove support comes in really handy when you're dealing with undergrads. Uh, we're still learning. It's new for 2U. So uh, pretty excited about what it means. 
Now, the second thing you said about business education, I got to tell you, this is all about the lifelong learner. It really is. Um, so we've got this construct we call the career curriculum continuum, and it's meant to represent career, the life of the student, curriculum, the university's role in that student's life, and continuum, we think, is the product strategy for a great university to, uh, to really meet the needs of the learner. And we think about it uh, from the standpoint of, you know, we, we thought this was important enough that to you through strategic M&A, you know, we kind of saw around the corners and uh, went and acquired a company based in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and acquired a company here in the States. Uh, the first company uh, handled uh, short courses. So instead of long form degrees, six to eight week courses in a variety of topics, many with B schools, uh, to help people stand out from the crowd, learn a new skill. You know, uh, if you look at the people that were let go during the pandemic, about a third say that they will need training in order to get a new job. And so this isn't going away. Um, and I think the great business school uh, needs to continue to evolve candidly, just like your school has done under your leadership to, you know, the boot camps that we're uh, operating, coding, data analytics, uh, are both, uh, and soon FinTech, you know, we've had over 200 graduates. They've gone on to work for American Express and CBS Interactive and Deloitte and uh, Florida Power and Light uh, that down there in Florida, um, pretty familiar with FPL. Uh, and so we think offering opportunities for people to further their education, whether it be a high quality degree uh, or a technical boot camp or something like um, a short course, you know, uh, and I'm pretty proud that our short courses are, you know, we're up to over, uh, we're almost about to hit 200 individual short courses. The portfolio is incredible. Schools like Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Harvard, Stanford. Uh, we just announced two weeks ago, our first relationship with an Italian school, Bocconi in Italy, the top B school in Italy will be doing short courses with us. So. I don't want to turn this into a pitch of you, but I'm telling you that short courses are a big part of the story. Lifelong learning is real. And, you know, if the great university doesn't go after it, that will be filled by venture back companies and other disruptors trying to go around the university. We really believe that the great university is the core. And, you know, we think a student when comparing their options, if they have an option to attend you know, would you rather get a certificate uh, where you learned coding from University of Miami or from General Assembly or Lambda? You know, candidly, I think you'd prefer to go to the U. So uh, we're pretty excited about what that means long term for business education. Uh, say a few words about, um, uh, say a few words to the critics who would say, well, online, online learning, online education, uh, it's not as robust. It can never be. Uh, uh, as sticky, um, there's no networking opportunity. Um, it really isn't delivering the same level of value. Um, and therefore, if I'm a parent who believes that this past year, I should be, uh, you know, fighting a lawsuit uh, to get a discount off the tuition I paid. What, okay, what, well, first, what do, you, what, what do you say to those concerns? I mean, first of all, this year is a bit unfair for, you know, like I, I think, you know, the world, how the world had to handle COVID, schools were forced to go online immediately. We took all of our boot camps online in five days, John. All of our boot camps took us five days, got everything online. By the way, it's gone so well that we'll never go back. They're, they've, it's gone fabulously. We had 57% growth in that part of our business. We call it alternative credentials, 57% growth in the current quarter. So uh, it was hard to deal with COVID and it's not fair to say that that's high quality online education. That was not high quality online education. And I will tell you, I got my MBA through a 2U back program. I didn't do it for the hair club for men effect. I didn't do it to eat my own dog food. I didn't do it for any of those reasons. I did it for me. I, when I graduated from GW, I got into politics. I'd never taken a single business course. And then I started a company and I ran that company for a decade and I really wanted my MBA. And so when we started 2U, I got really into the idea. My board and my wife thought I was a little nuts, but I enrolled and was accepted at Carolina. It took me five years to graduate, but I got to tell you, it was awesome. It was hard. You know, it was really, really hard, but the experience 
you know, I became a Tar Heel. And the reality is like, I made great friends. I met great faculty. The networking opportunities were profound. And it's not an either or. I mean, that's part of the problem is like the whole notion of being online. You know, do you really like, do you think of it like today the same way you used to that you're online shopping? No, you don't. You're just going shopping. And sometimes you're buying something online and sometimes you're stopping at a store. And the reality is like, that's where higher ed is going. It's about being blended and connected. It's not about being online. So one of the things we've experienced in all of our online programs is students want to get together physically. So we do all of these physical things. They're called immersions. They're wildly popular. Uh, all of our B schools do it. And hundreds of students come to the immersions on a weekend so they can fit it into their work life. And by the way, they're super fun speaking from experience. Uh, so it's not just a learning experience, it's also fun. And I would say online education done right, one of the annoying things about the dialogue in the media about how higher ed had to handle COVID is like, okay, urgently go online. I mean, why is there an NFL game on right now at 3.40 in the afternoon because of COVID? You think that's gonna get the same ratings it would get normally? No, it's COVID. Like we've all had to deal with things and change how we do things and I thought higher ed did a pretty damn good job, to be honest, given how little time people had to prepare. Now, does that mean that that's high quality online ed? No. If you do it high quality, you know, we, our Gallup survey, I thought really proved that, you know, every single metric in the Gallup survey was better than the national comps for offline ed, for campus-based ed. So I thought like we finally had some real data to put in front of people and say, look, when you do it well, it's really freaking good. Uh, now we have to keep proving that because obviously the experience wasn't good for some people in COVID, uh, no doubt. You know, I have a son in college and I have uh, a boy in, uh, my youngest is a sophomore in high school. My oldest is a freshman at Syracuse. And, you know, it's tough when you, when you really wanna be on campus to have to go and do all your classes fully online. Uh, but I would say if you make the right investments, it really pays off. Uh, just want to encourage uh, our audience members to uh, please send in uh, some questions on the Q&A function. Uh, so let, let me start uh, here with a couple of those. Uh, what's the most important element of a successful online course? So I think you have to be intentional about the learning design to create a path of guided instruction for the student that should you know, have a, a core learning objective. So we call it the learning experience framework. It's that's to use approach. Uh, there are other approaches. There are some that, that are that are they're perfectly fine. In our case, we're trying to take the student with the great faculty through this guided path. It's called learn, feel, do. Um, I, I won't get into the weeds here. I guess I would say to that question, uh, being intentional in what you are trying to deliver to the student and using all of the tools that one has when you go online so that you're not just sitting in a two hour Zoom. Um, you know, that's, that's not the best use of the technology. We do think, by the way, the live environment is a great component in all of our programs, creates the right level of intimacy. You really get to know the students. You can ask questions of the faculty in a way that, that is, is much more difficult to do in a purely asynchronous program. But you know, a single two U course in, uh, in any of our degree programs has more video content than a season of Game of Thrones. You know, it's a lot of content. And so, um, you know, chunking that content up in this guided path and then using that interactive, uh, inter using interactive technology to fully engage the student before they go to their live class so that when they get to live class, it's a discussion. You know, you're effectively flipping the classroom. And we found you can do that at any level. You know, we, we have some high school courses we've done We've done it at the undergrad level very successfully. And of course, we've now done it at scale at the graduate level. Um, how many students uh, will you have served this year? This year, I don't know the this year stat off the top of my head, but we just passed 250,000 learners total uh, inception to date. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a worldwide phenomenon. You know, our, our largest markets for our short courses are uh, in Asia. Uh, the short courses are sold literally all over the world. Our degrees uh, tend to be sold more in the 
uh, the countries that they're offered, although the London School of Economics program, it's $25,000 for the entire degree. Uh, and it's, it's today, it's, you know, I think we have students from something like 120 countries right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, that, that is a worldwide product. And in that uh, worldwide context, uh, how should uh, universities or how do you recommend universities handle the balance between synchronous and asynchronous instruction? So we think of it, you know, as roughly half and half, but it depends on the learning objective. It depends on what you're trying to teach. So we have um, a content strategy team that works directly with each faculty member to build out the content and to be thoughtful about that path for the student to work through uh, each individual uh, problem that they're approaching. Uh, we have a bunch of cool things. You know, We just debuted for um, our social work programs, a virtual field practicum experience where students can interact uh, online before they go into the field to do their clinical placement. Because you, know, you think about it, if you're in a social work program, when you go into the field for the first time, it's super stressful. You know, you're sitting across from somebody who lost everything in a fire or has a drug addiction or was, you know, returned for the, from the war with PTSD. Like these are highly stressful engagements. And so being able to do it in an interactive fashion uh, using uh, both video technology and actors uh, who are portraying people with particular conditions, uh, that's a new piece of tech that we just put out there for all of our social work programs. We're pretty excited about it. We have something for our law programs that is now being used more broadly in the portfolio um, that allows, it's called the bi-directional learning tool and it replicates the Socratic method using interactive technology. Uh, so, you know, I think there's not, I mean, you look at our Yale Physician Assistant Program, that was the one program everybody told us you could never do it online. You know, there's even cadavers in that program, John. We have cadavers in that program because, you know, you got to go and dissect the cadaver, you know, so. Um, there's really nothing you can't do online if you put your mind to it. Um, but being thoughtful in that design process is pretty critical. Uh, we found great faculty from the campus when they really engage, it fundamentally changes the way they'll teach permanently. Um, there is quite a flood of questions coming in, so I'm going to bunch. Let's do it. Going to bunch a few together here. Um, number one. Uh, can you talk a little bit about are you doing anything in Latin America? Um, secondly, um, to you is not currently profitable. When do you expect it to be profitable? Uh, and then uh, thirdly, within the field of business, uh, which um, topic areas seem to be gathering the most traction uh, in terms of short course demand? Okay, if I don't remember all those questions, yep, please sure. read them back yep. to me. The profitability question, I can tell you, whoever asked that one, I got gotcha, you, is that uh, this past quarter, we were really proud to uh, uh, to transition into profitability for the first time. So we had a right. nicely positive profitability uh, quarter, adjusted EBITDA, uh, as with adjusted EBITDA as the measure, uh, which is how most of the street tends to think about profitability. So um, we were pretty proud of that. So uh, it's been a long road to get there. Uh, but we, we, we are now profitable and have told the street that we expect to remain profitable on an ongoing basis. Um, pretty excited about what next year uh, will look like for 2U on the bottom line. So that one was easy. Uh, probably more important to the, to the public investors right now is something else that public investors are really paying attention to is free cash flow for 2U. Uh, you know, we invest a lot in our program, so that gets a lot of attention. There's a J curve associated with each degree program and we're working pretty hard to sort of get them launched faster and to reduce the size of the J curve. And that re resulted in a $90 million improvement in trailing 12 month free cash flow. So that was big news for investors. And we're, we're now telling the street that by third quarter of next year, we will actually move into positive free cash flow territory. So, uh, so that question was pretty easy. Uh, in terms of short course topics, when we acquired the company, which was called Get Smarter, you can find it at GetSmarter.com. Uh, Get Smarter was almost entirely reliant on uh, disruptive technolo technology oriented courses, things like blockchain. Uh, and we wanted to broaden the aperture, widen the aperture of the short course business. We thought that would make it uh, long term more sustainable. Uh, we thought it would make it indeed more profitable. Uh, we also thought it would make it less risky uh, because uh, technical short courses uh, you know, they are uh, 
really, they tend to be a little bit more like hit driven products. So as an example, the blockchain short courses, they really track, excuse me, they really track to Bitcoin. So as Bitcoin does well, the blockchain course sells more. And we uh, are pretty proud to say that we broadened the portfolio, not just from the number of clients. Now there's, I think we now have 24 university clients offering short courses with 2U, but we also um, broadened the subject areas pretty significantly. So uh, we have functional courses and leadership courses. So an example of a short course that's doing incredibly well right now is with Northwestern University, we launched um, a diversity short course with a nationally uh, known uh, Northwestern faculty member named Al Tillery. And that one in particular, John, is doing really well with the enterprise clients um, mm -hmm. because diversity training is pretty critical right now, uh, given the tumultuous year we had and the amount of progress that the country needs to still make on diversity. Uh, so now on the, uh, on the non-short course side, the business schools are doing quite well with business analytics, data science. Um, we're about to launch our first artificial intelligence certificate with Columbia University. Uh, so these long form certificates, non-degree, they operate right between uh, the uh, short course and the degree. Uh, so they're a little bit more in that boot camp territory. Uh, those are doing well. And then I think the final question is, are we active in Latin America? Uh, Monterey Tech is our one university partner that's based in Latin America, one of the best schools in Latin America, uh, based in Mexico. Uh, and we are working with them on a Master of Business Administration. Uh, and we're working right now on the LATAM uh, outreach strategy uh, for that particular MBA program. Now, our short courses do sell worldwide. And we were pretty excited to have our first short course uh, fully translated into both Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, it's a Stanford nutrition short course. Uh, and that's done really well and was pretty excited about three weeks ago, we announced a pretty major expansion of our partnership with Stanford with about 10 new short courses. When you're serving so many universities, um, how do you deal with issues or how do universities deal with issues associated with uh, conflicts? and uh, the concern that as you add more and more partners, there's gonna be dilution of the, uh, of the uh, demand available to any one partner. That is such a good question. And I, you know, I could have used that question when answering the difference between us and the MOOCs. Um, I will tell you that as people come into the MOOC funnel and you think about it as a marketing funnel, uh, there's only so many options to serve them. And that's not how 2U works. So a big distinction between us in the powered by model and the MOOC model is that we do a bespoke marketing campaign for every single program, every single short course and every single boot camp that we bring in. And so, uh, you know, when we work with a new school partner, we are offering their individual MBA to uh, through a bespoke marketing campaign that gets the added benefit of the network and the leverage that we get across the university partners, uh, but is still distinct to that school. So we found uh, that we're able to manage that cannibalization concern and still drive really high quality enrollment for each institution. Now I'd also note that, you know, we're not trying to power every university in the country. That's not how 2U works. So it's, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're very sort of selective in who we work with. Um, and on the degree side, we do think about regional bias a lot. So uh, when, when, when great universities launch in a, a particular discipline, while they do get students everywhere, the students get increasingly expensive for the university as the university, as you get farther from the location of the campus. You know, it's interesting that the campus is this centering function, even for the online program. So we're careful about where we locate our 2U powered uh, degree programs. It's a little different in the short courses, but I um, love that question from that. That was a little bit in the weeds there. Well, here, here's another uh, pretty good one, I think as well, very important. How do, how, do you how do you advise universities to reconcile the pricing of their in-residence programs with the online um, version? So 80% of our programs are priced at or below the campus. There are some cases where for particular reasons, the university is priced at above, but most of the time it's either priced at the campus level or below. 
Uh, we are working very, um, you know, candidly on affordability across our program sets. Um, you know, I do think during the economic expansion, tuition continued to increase at a rate that's not sustainable. So as you get scale, you can really roll back the cost curve. So an example of a place we've done that, John, is uh, Simmons University out of Boston has been an incredible partner for 2U, started in nursing and then social work at the graduate level, and then expanded first at the graduate level pretty substantially, and then more recently uh, started powering all of their under, undergrad experience, both for the campus and for new online degrees. And so because of that scale, we were really able to directly attack affordability. Simmons uh, decreased its, its Master of Science in Nursing, both for the campus and online by 14%. And it's only because of 2U. Uh, and so we really liked that from the standpoint of what it would do for the world. Interestingly, it also had a very positive business impact. Why? Marketing is expensive and conversion goes down as you price these programs up. So by reducing the price, we actually made the program more competitive and affordable, and it resulted in a pretty sizable enrollment increase. Uh, so we think that's a model to pursue across our program portfolio. Now, that's not our call. It is the university's call. Uh, but we're happy to say that many of our partners are starting to focus on affordability as a core part of sort of meeting society's critical needs. Mm -hmm. So people will hear about that from 2U much more over the next five years. Are there any areas of online learning that are at risk or is it just growth, growth, growth everywhere? There's a lot of growth ahead. You know, if you think about the percent of the overall higher education market that is digitized worldwide is about 2%. So we are in very early days. 2U has been doing this a long time, but it's still early innings. You know, that, that analogy I gave you about um, retail and when you compare retail to higher ed or to education overall, you know, a Amazon is obviously, um, you know, huge percentage of, um, online retail, I think it's in the, I think it's at 50% of US online retail, but it's still at a very low percentage of, uh, of a small single digit percentage of, or maybe mid single digit percentage of total retail. And we think that online is in a similar journey to where uh, online ed is in a similar journey to where online retail has been. Uh, and, you know, we're in a really good position to uh, to capitalize on the market opportunity that's out there. Uh, you know, we do think to you, uh, because of our comprehensive approach and our product diversity, really becomes a great partner for school. And, you know, like University of Miami, we're offering boot camps. That doesn't mean that University of Miami will offer everything through to you. There's plenty of opportunities for the school to offer uh, online programs uh, either on their own or with somebody else. But, but as the relationship builds, we love the fact that uh, we're here with all these different product sets and product types as an option for a school like Miami. So um, now I would say to that person that asked that question, you know, one of the things that we're pretty excited about is we think there will be, uh, you know, over time, we think we'll have our first online MD. We think we'll have our first online dentistry program. Um, you know, the reality is the world's ready for it. Uh, and, you know, those are areas where when we get there, just like with our physician assistant program, I'm sure it'll be wildly controversial, but that's the fun, you know, is that's, that's sort of earth shattering. So for two you, we want to focus on some things that, uh, you know, that really are going to change the world. And we think that's an example of something that really could change the world. So a very, a very practical question uh, that many of our faculty have uh, been contending with, how, how do you assure that a person taking an online exam is actually taking the exam? Well, online proctoring has become uh, quite controversial in online education circles. You know, we, uh, we work with each university to, uh, first of all, it's a pretty robust enrollment process that is managed by us uh, to verify that the person that's getting in is that person. And most of our degree programs, almost all of them have such intimacy between the faculty and the student uh, that we, um, it, it's pretty easy for us to verify in our model that that student is that person. Uh, so average class size across our portfolio is uh, currently, I believe, 13. So you're talking about small live classes between faculty and students. 
Uh, and then from a proctoring standpoint, the best, the best possible uh, solution is to de design the course up front in a way that makes cheating very difficult. Uh, and, and that's really possible. I mean, I can tell you in our, in our MBA program that I took, you know, even if my wife was a CPA, I don't think she could have helped me with the accounting exam. I really don't, uh, just based on the way it was designed. So, um, so there's, there's, there's really good ways, both using technology and more practical ways uh, to prevent, uh, to, to do your best to prevent cheating. Now, ultimately, uh, academic integrity is a huge issue for campus programs, not just for online programs. You know, candidly, I actually think it's easier for us to manage it than it is our partners' campus-based programs. Um, are there, is there any possibility, and perhaps you would say it's already here, any possibility of online learning delivering a better student outcome than face-to-face? Uh, -face. Yeah, I mean, John, I would point- uh, And why, I, why, would that, why would that be the case if you agree it is? I would point that person to our website to look at the Gallup survey. So about, I don't know, four or five months ago, we released a survey with Gallup, which we did at some risk because the benefit of doing it with Gallup is the rigor is there. Uh, the downside to doing it with Gallup is, you know, you can't cherry pick the results and put them out. You know, you got to put the whole thing out. And uh, we put the whole thing out. And I could tell you, it showed across all kinds of different categories that the online programs are to you powered online programs were higher than the national benchmarks across almost every category. And then 92% of the students surveyed said they would do it all over again. So I got to tell you, like, I think we're there. You know, our board pass rates in two U powered programs for programs that have board pass rates, you know, that have that have board exams like nursing or physician assistant or speech, all those programs, the board pass rates are equal to the campus program. They're really good. Uh, so it's a different environment, but at this point, candidly, I think it's better. For grad education, I do think it's better. Can you just say a few more words uh, about your own experience at uh, UNC in terms of uh, the deep relationships that you formed with uh, folks in your cohort? Um, yeah, Corey Broussard. You, talk, you talked a little bit about the uh, immersion weekends. Uh, any other techniques that you've seen used to foster that degree of camaraderie and uh, networking that returns later um, in terms of uh, alumni donations? I mean, uh, you know, the Carolina story is pretty crazy. Um, the first cohort of the Carolina program, upon graduation, gave a class gift that was the largest in the history of the school. And they named a conference room after themselves, which they thought was quite ironic, given that they were naming <laughs> a physical, they called it, so there were 19 students in the first cohort, and they called themselves the O-19. The, it stood for the original 19. And they literally named a conference room at Carolina after themselves with the O-19 uh, uh, plaque, which is really hilarious. Um, you know, my experience, uh, the reason I said the name Corey Broussard, I don't know if he's watching, but a very good friend of mine in the program, Corey was a, is a Shell oil engineer who was stationed in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico on an oil rig getting his MBA. So Business Week did a story on him that was called getting your MBA in the middle of nowhere, you know, and not only did he do it and do really well, but at the immersions, we had such a good time. <laughs> uh, so uh, he became a, a really good friend. And, you know, I made a lot of really close friends in the program. You know, the CFO of the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line was in the program with me. Uh, an Olympic silver medalist in skiing was in the program. Like, when you unleash the university from its physical boundaries, you know, you get great students. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was fun. You know, I mean, it was hard, but it was fun. By the way, those immersions, John, mm -hmm. they were really intense, both during the day and at night. Mm -hmm. You Understood. know, I mean, they were great, you know, so it felt uh, it, it felt very much like being uh, in a campus program. It was awesome. So fi final question. And thanks so much for uh, joining us. Um, you know, University of Miami is doing a few things in this arena, uh, but it's it's a latecomer to the party. Are we too late? God, no.
you know, the, the, uh, think about what I said, 2% of higher ed is digitized. That comes from whole and IQ. I didn't make up that number. 2%. Like it is not too late. If you're a great student, you know, the number of people that have had an affiliation with the U in some way, and, you know, and I know this from growing up in South Florida, like my God, people are obsessed. Uh, and the tentacles that the U has around the world, uh, you have a great ability to continue to extend your brand on a worldwide basis uh, by jumping in in each discipline. And you got to have the faculty behind you. So it's more than likely going to be at a school by school level. But you are not too late. It's early innings. You know, I mean, Two U's been doing this for a long time, but when we started, people thought we were lunatics. I mean, you know, the, there were no schools online that were great schools. It was all for-profit schools. Mm -hmm. You know, today there are more and more people online, but I got to tell you, it's definitively not too late. Um, one of our guiding principles at Two U's is to be bold and fearless. Uh, and we think of it internally as, you know, you know, take the risk to, to, to put yourself out there to innovate, to do something differently than the world does it. And I would say for the great institution, be bold and fearless, like jump out there because the world needs University of Miami in the online world. And by the way, our boot camps kind of prove it. They're doing great. Good. Super. Chip, uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Uh, all of your insights have been uh, really helpful. We have a lot of faculty and staff members on the uh, webinar this evening and uh, it's been really kind of you to share your perspectives with us. So thrilled to be here. The best. Congratulations on uh, being profitable and uh, uh, good night from Miami. Thank you, John. Great being with everybody. I guess, should I end like this? Should I end like this? That's good. That's good. Thank you, Chip. So, take care.